All right, hey folks, so you are being gaslit. Now, I think it's fair to say that the current hypertrophy research we see has been getting increasingly more ridiculous over the course of the last 15 years, right? We're now seeing studies which look at 45 sets per week and blah, blah, blah. We have this seemingly endless relationship of more and more volume equals more and more gains. None of that really supports reality of what we're seeing to be true in the field. So there was a video released yesterday by Lyle McDonald, who brought to light a research study which was done late last year. And it was a critique of work specifically from the lab of Brad Schoenfeld. As you all know, he is a prolific researcher in this field. In fact, I would hazard a guess to say that the majority of you who look at hypertrophy science only look at work which has been touched by Brad. Now, the problem is, just to get straight into this, the problem is if the research coming out of Brad's lab cannot be trusted for various reasons, which we'll go into in a second. So the problem is quite simply this. One, you have research coming out of a particular lab which may well be providing people with the wrong conclusions. The second problem is that specific lab is very vocal. So we are now in a situation where over the course of the last 15 years, as the majority of hypertrophy science we are exposed to, which most people who just log on to social media see, comes from this lab. And you guys think that research represents the breadth of research across the entire industry when it doesn't. Now, that's not your fault. Where you look, which is social media, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all is work which has been influenced by that particular lab. And as a result, over the last 15 years, unknowingly, you have been dragged into an echo chamber. That echo chamber seemingly is being started to be pried open. And that's what this video is about. So with that introduction, before I go on any further, if you like my work, please do hit like, subscribe, uh, hit the bell notification. And if you're interested in coaching, there's a link in the description. Now, the goal for this video is to briefly go over some of the problems which were identified in this new study of the work coming out of Brad's lab. Now, that's a small part. La McDonald has done a great job of tearing through all that. So I'm going to link his video down below. As well as that, I'm going to link the original research paper so you guys can read it yourself. I'm just going to go over a few points from the paper, but I mostly today want to discuss the far-reaching consequences and where do we go from here. The first critique is that it seems to be the case that from Brad's lab, but when he's taking into account other pieces of research, he seems to dismiss quite easily research which doesn't support his conclusion. And he seems to accept other research which does, even though that may have the same limitation. Now, it's the start of the video. If you don't believe me, let me just give you an example. So there's an example of one research study which was dismissed because it was measuring muscle growth in the arms. Brad dismissed it by saying that the participants could have performed additional arm work, which is a fair criticism, you know. But then he accepted another paper where he admitted that those participants may have done additional arm work as well. So there's no consistency. Now, bias is a real thing. We all have bias. You have bias. I have bias. Everybody has bias. But in science, that's why we have tools to rid us of bias. We have things like Cochrane, for example. If, we, if we're going to ignore those tools, we can't expect a rigorous procedure because we are all exposed to bias. And in credit to Lyle, he actually pointed this out uh, a couple of years back on a Revive Stronger podcast with uh, Mike Isretel as part of his critique. So he has been saying this for a while. Second criticism from the paper is that the way the test groups are set up almost lends itself to the conclusion that they are looking for. So for example, very often these volume studies are set up with low, medium, and high volume groups. And a lot of times the difference between the medium and the high volume group is, is insignificant, it's very small. But in Brad's lab, they seem to take that as a increasing trend. So let's say the, the higher group is just slightly higher. The, the, uh, but in scientific terms, the, the difference is uh, irrelevant or insignificant they would still take that as a trend. Whereas in reality, it's not a trend, it's seemingly 
up to moderate and then a plateau. That would be the scientific way of looking at things. So there is this misinterpretation. And again, not using correct scientific tools or terminology. Now, at this point, some of you guys might be thinking, what is Fasner? He's not a scientist. Like, I'm relaying information and critiques from the paper, which is linked in the description. These are not my critiques. These are all backed up by legitimate researchers in the field. Third critique is that it seems to be the case that from Brad's lab, the higher volume groups or, or any sort of conclusion they're looking for, like, for example, longer rest periods, seem to get unusually robust results. Now, what I mean by that is, as a polite way of saying, the results seem to be impossible, essentially. So I'll give you an example. So there was one study which demonstrated that the growth achieved was four and a half times that seen in other studies from different labs. So you have a situation where tens, if not hundreds of studies are pointing to a particular size of growth for, let's say, 20 sets per week, 40 sets per week or long rest periods versus short rest periods, whatever it might be. But then from Brad's lab, you have these extraordinary results. So either Brad's a really good personal trainer, or we have to view these results with a degree of skepticism, I would. If you've got two studies from the same lab, which are showing results way above tens of hundreds of other studies looking at the same thing, we have to question that, right? And again, this is science. We can't just out and out call people a liar, but we have to question things. And we have to look at things with a degree of skepticism. The, the, the fourth critique is that the timing of the tests are not sufficiently away from the last training session. Now, all of the studies from Brad's lab seem to use about 48 hours as a time frame between the final training session to when they test growth. The problem with that 48 hour figure is it was taken from a fairly flimsy piece of research. So it would be more realistic to wait a little bit longer before you test because you don't want to test people when their muscles are inflamed from the sheer amount of volume they've been doing. If you've done 45 sets of squats or whatever it is, like your legs are probably going to be a little bit inflamed for more than a couple of days. So it wouldn't be fair to take the measurements at that stage. You'd have to wait a bit longer. The study that they are using to support this 48 hour time frame doesn't seem to be valid. And again, it may be one of the reasons why they were getting results which are seemingly impossible to replicate because it's not actually muscle growth, it's just cell swelling. So those are just four critiques. Now, if you want to hear more, watch Lyle's video, but I want to discuss the consequences that it has on us as a community, which I think is more important. But yeah, the main point is the studies done from Brad's lab don't seem to support the majority of studies in the field. But the problem is the studies from Brad's lab are very vocal. That's what you guys are seeing. So what you guys are seeing as a representation of hypertrophy science is only a small slither of what's actually out there. And why is that? That is down to a, a term that I coined last year, which is that is down to the hypertrophy research superstar, right? This idea that a lot of these researchers from Brad's lab, they're not just researchers, like they're influencers as well. You've heard of them all. You've heard of Brad, you've heard of Mike Isretel, you've heard of Milo Wolf, you've heard of all these people. Have you guys heard of Samuel L. Buckner or Enrique Moreno? No disrespect to them, but I've not heard of them. So you're seeing a very small sample of science and you think that is a representation of the breadth of science. So as a result, if you don't agree with it, or let's say you see a condescending meme, one of those like Chad Virgin ones talking about science and how you're a high volume denier or all that kind of stuff, that's gonna put you off. And all of a sudden, you've been put off science as a whole. But in reality, you're not anti-science. You're just anti this small group of researchers. So that's the consequence of this type of what is actually a potentially a bit of a scandal. So I think the issue is, unknowingly, we have been sucked into an echo chamber because this small group of researchers from this small lab, which represents a small window of hypertrophy research they are very vocal because they're influencers now as a result that's all we see but the problem is it's not all you guys see it's all other influencers see too so to take that one step further there's an even bigger problem here you think that's a representation of the research it doesn't only affect you 
it affects other content creators as well. So they then go in to YouTube, go into Instagram saying, hey, I've read this study. Look at this. Volume is the key drive for growth. Long rest periods are better than short rest periods. And before you know it, everybody within our little community of that, our YouTube community, Instagram community is saying the same thing. It has a knock on echo chamber. And if anybody says, actually, maybe shorter rest periods are valid, what's going to happen? You're going to get somebody in the comments going, nope, I prefer longer ones. The research backs it up. You're wrong. And I know that because I talked about shorter rest periods years ago. And I got so much backlash because those people who gave me that backlash, they were brainwashed by this research. Do you see how dangerous an echo chamber is? My thought is the consequence of this whole debacle, if it's true, is that unknowingly over the last 15 years, you guys have been progressively more and more sucked into an echo chamber of recommendations which do not reflect reality and may well be counterproductive. I also think this has ruined some of your relationships with science. I think some of you are very anti-science now when you don't need to be because the general science on this topic is quite good. In a way, this is actually a very valuable video. There's no need to be anti-science. You're not anti-science. You're simply disagreeing with a small lab. Now, what are the consequences of this? I think if this paper we're talking about is valid, I think we have to look at the work of all the researchers involved in Brad's lab with a much larger degree of skepticism than we currently do. Anyone who's directly involved with Brad or anyone for, who has come from his lab, who has taught underneath him, everyone associated with him in a working capacity needs to be looked at with a degree of skepticism, particularly if they are also a hypertrophy research superstar. So as a result, we have to be very cautious about recommendations involving higher volume is better. Also regarding longer rest periods are better than short rest periods. Also regarding volume cycling, that is, taking volume from low amounts to high amounts. Also the length and partial work and also higher frequency work. Now, a lot of you will agree in some areas. A lot of you will agree with the volume stuff, but you'll be hesitant with the rest period stuff, the volume cycling stuff, the length and partial stuff. But you've got to realize that's the same brainwashing. That's the same echo chamber. Now, we can't form any conclusions yet, okay? But what I'm saying is, we need to approach that with a larger degree of skepticism than we had before. I think this is, considering how small our fitness industry is, this is a potentially very far reaching study. And if the critique is valid, I think this could be pretty damning. So just to finish with where to get specific recommendations, I'll say this to begin with, my hypertrophy fundamentals playlist is still solid because I didn't base my information on data from research papers. I base my information on what has worked practically with people I work with. I've been a coach now for 10 years. So my hypertrophy recommendations are still very valid. My set recommendations, my frequency recommendations, my intensity recommendations are all solid. Have a look at the hypertrophy fundamentals playlist, which is listed in my channel, and you can get a good grasp of what you should be doing. That's a good place to start. But aside from that, I think just watch this space. I think we need to see where this goes. But yeah, <laughs> big revelations, big critiques, potentially very far reaching outcomes. I think this is huge. Yeah. All right, folks. I'll call it that.